Welcome Grady Levins to our fantastic life sciences show here on Mindset Learn Extra. So today we're doing gaseous exchange problems with myself and our favorite teacher Cheryl. <laughs> Give it up for Cheryl. Yeah, woo. okay. But I just wanted to tell you where to get all your information from in case you didn't, well, most of you won't watch the grade 10 show, but in case you did or you didn't, nevertheless, you get it on facebook.com forward slash learn extra or on Twitter at learn extra. Or if you want to sit with the notes in front of you as we go through them, it's www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn extra. And I'll be on the page with you for an hour and Cheryl and I will answer all the questions you have, all the problems you have, because it's gaseous exchange problems actually. So if you do have problems, Holla on Facebook and we will answer all your questions. Okay, but I'm gonna leave you now and Cheryl's gonna take over, so take over, Cheryl. <laughs> Megan is so funny. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> like I'm having a little like, party, like say it, I can hear it. Woo, I can hear it. <laughs> uh, good evening, all of you. Welcome. Those of you who are watching the Grade 10 one. Wow, awesome. Aslam did a fantastic uh, um, prank there with the heart. I'm very proud of Megan. She she didn't cringe. No, I was I watching was like in the <gasps> control room heart. there. She was doing very well, but um, some of the control room I yeah, didn't know was looking a bit, like <gasps> looking a bit uh, green <laughs> around the edges. <laughs> All right, no specimens tonight because unfortunately we're at a little bit on the uh, contagious side. We're going to, last week if you tuned in, you would have seen we looked at the gaseous exchange system. So we looked at the lungs, we looked at the anatomy of the lungs. Um, we did mechanism of breathing, how we get oxygen in, how we get carbon dioxide out. We looked at gaseous exchange, moving oxygen and carbon dioxide from the alveoli into the blood and then from the blood into the tissues and getting the carbon dioxide out. So last week we looked just basically at the anatomy and physiology. If we start to look at the problems of the gaseous exchange system, all right, that's when um, like a disease, like a virus or bacteria, all right, is going to affect the lungs. It's going to obviously affect the ability that you are able to breathe. We're also going to have a look at um, how smoking is going to affect the lungs. We're <laughs> going to be looking at um, how height above sea level, altitude, also has, effect, uh, has an effect on how the lungs are going to function. So if I go to my outline for the day, you'll see, there we go. We're going to be looking at a few problems, all right? We're going to be looking at TB again, all right? Because now you can tie up with the microorganisms that you did at the beginning of the year. When you did microorganisms and you did bacteria, you should have, all right, might, I'm sure you maybe did it, but you might have done TB as your case study. Okay, we're looking at asthma, hay fever, bronchitis, and lung cancer. So what we're going to do there is we're going to look at the different diseases. We're going to look what causes, all right, all these things, what, what symptoms are they showing, how can we prevent it, and how can we treat it. So when you do, like, when you do your study notes, put up a little table or put up a little um, um, diagram and for each of those. Cause symptoms, treatment, prevention. All right, and then see if you're then able to just jot down quick notes to be a quick reminder for you. We're also going to quickly look, as I said to you, at the smoking laws in South Africa. Those of you um, My who mother should be watching your right mother now. watching? <laughs> <laughs> please watch now. <laughs> Megan's mother, please watch. My mom doesn't smoke, so I'm very, I'm very lucky there. Yeah, she's the only one. Mm. She's, she must stop. She must stop. <laughs> Otherwise, she's just going to have, um, what is that? Emphysema, emphysema or whatever. We're actually going to look at that as well. Yep. All right, we're going to look at emphysema as well. Good. Okay, so we're going to look at the smoking laws. South Africa has brought in a few quite strict um, smoking laws since 2009 and how that it might affect oh. you. We're going to look at CPR. S um, sometimes people might stop breathing and CPR, all right, is artificial resuscitation, how to get their heart going and the, the oxygen back into the lungs. And then, as I said, Height above sea level, altitude. The higher we go, all right, there's less oxygen available that we can use. And it's going to have an effect on how we are going to then be able to bring in that oxygen and use it. Okay, let's start off, all right, with our first respiratory disease. I've put pictures in here. I want, obviously, 
often, you know, trying to, some of them are quite graphic, right? But unfortunately, when it comes to the diseases of the lungs, the, the symptoms and what the lungs look like, you know, and almost like shock therapy, you, you want to be able to shock to say, listen here, you need to be able to stop smoking if it comes to that, and, and then maybe things will get better. The first one we look at is, all right, is TB, tuberculosis. Now, if you look at the structure over here, and I've got this computer-generated one, we were looking at a bacteria. And when we did bacteria in the beginning, <coughs> all right, if you had a look, I think you did, I'm sure you should have, all right, we looked at the different shapes of the bacteria. And if you have a look here, this is a rod-shaped, and we know that a rod-shaped is a bacillus. All right, so bacillus, our rod shaped, is a bacillus. Now, the TB, all right, is a bacterial particle that obviously gets breathed in. Now, if we have a look here, unfortunately, this is a diagram of the lungs, all right? And last week when we looked at the lungs, we know they should be nice and pink <laughs> and spongy and healthy. They are. And yeah, <laughs> we, we're starting to see because the bacteria is going to go into the lungs and it's going to start making these little nodules, all right? Almost as if the, the it becomes hard, okay? So, how do we get it? I, I love this picture. I know it's so revolting, <laughs> all right? Um, but Rather. I don't think you guys, when you don't put your hand in front of your mouth when you sneeze, all right, realize how gross it really is because you can literally see, all right, all your saliva, Right, um, just disappearing and being squirted out there. The bacteria, all right, is if it's in an affected person, it's in their lungs. Okay, so what will happen in the lungs? It can be in the mucus, in the phlegm, in the saliva. So if they sneeze, it's what we, that that phlegm that they bring up. Another word for it is called sputum. Okay, so if a person who is infected sneezes, and the the bacteria then becomes airborne. Somebody can then breathe it in, all right, through their nose or through their mouth. So, as I said to you, one of the things we can really skip through to prevention, putting your hand in front of your nose, all right, and your mouth when you sneeze, or using a hanky, or just covering up so that you don't squirt all over the place. Now, the thing with TB is, is that it will attack, it goes through to the lungs, okay, and if your immune system is healthy, then the TB virus almost, we said bacteria, the bacteria is contained. There's almost like a capsule that forms around it, and it doesn't start to spread. But, unfortunately, if you have a, a low immune system, and very often that's why they do link it to HIV, all right, and AIDS, is that if your immune system has been compromised, it's much easier for that bacteria then to start to do the damage in your lungs. Okay? We look at the symptoms. I put these pictures in over here. I like that woman at the coffee. I think that's what I look like first thing in the morning. <laughs> All right. Persistent cough, tired, fatigued. Um, you don't have to have every single one of those symptoms. And one of the, everybody says that this is the most common, the blood in the saliva or coughing up blood. Not necessarily. All right. A dry, maybe persistent cough, very tired. Um, night sweats when you feel at night, it's almost as if you've got this cold sweat breaking out all over you. Um, loss of weight, if you'll see here. All right. Tiredness. This gentleman over here, as you can see, he has TB and he has lost a lot of weight, all right? Because the body is just trying to fight the infection. Now, the treatment to TB, that is the most important thing because this is the one thing, one of the diseases that definitely can be cured. And it, and, but unfortunately, it goes down to being, you have to keep with it. Okay, so what will happen if a person does have TB? They have what is called a cocktail of drugs. So they've got a whole lot of drugs that they're going to use. But the most important thing is what we call this DOTS. All right, DOTS. Direct observation, um, observed therapy, what they call short course. Basically what it is is there are centers set out all over the show for people to go and get their medicine every day. So if you do have TB and you are given medicine, which is for free, all right, government hospitals and clinics, it is freely available. 
But the problem is you have to take it for six months. Okay? So what happens? The patient goes in, they take these antibiotics, and after a couple of weeks, they say, oh, no, I feel much better, and they stop. That is the worst thing they can do because what happens is that bacteria, because you actually haven't killed everything, feeling better doesn't necessarily mean that everything has gone away. So in doing that, what you do is, I'm sure those of you who read the news, etc., you, you've heard about <coughs> sorry, the antibiotic-resistant TB. Right? TB that can't be treated with medicine. And that is the reason, the reason for that is people are stopping their medication before they finish that six months. Once they have finished that six months, they pretty much are TB free. Right? They have to go for regular checkups. All right? So those, when, you, when, you, when you stop in the middle, that goes for antibiotics as well. When you stop in the middle, you actually allow the bacteria to almost to, to get resistance. And it can actually, then it, it mutates and it becomes very harmful because if you can't treat it with medicine, it's going to clear. Now, if we look at the prevention, all right, if I have a look over here for, um, for the, the pictures for prevention, the prevention is, it sounds very simple, okay? It sounds very simple, but very often, people who are mo more prone to deep TB are where overcrowding occurs. They, um, there isn't access to fresh food and vegetable. They, they, they don't have a really good diet, um, those kind of things. So if you, unfortunately, are living in an environment where this, the circumstances are not hygienic, it does make getting it and getting it and getting it over and done, over and done with much more difficult. Okay? But what they can do, one of the things is called the BCG vaccine. All right, the vaccine, you are vaccinated against TB, right, so your body can withstand it. And then they're just usual day-to-day -day things. Hygiene, washing hands, um, sneezing into a handkerchief, sneezing, not sneezing out in the open, um, cleaning, washing, and washing your hands after you do things, after you've prepared food, after you go to the bathroom, etc. Okay, and then as, as, as you can see there, the healthy diet. So it's also, it's a lifestyle, right? It's certain small little actions, and then also helping with the vaccination. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Right, I won't say this is a common one, but asthma, all right? The, the more polluted our air becomes, unfortunately, more people start to get asthma. Now, asthma is an allergic reaction. Now, I want you just quickly, all right, if we have a look, if you see here, what happens is, if you look, is that the breathing passages, and I want to actually go to the next picture, then I'm going to come back to this one. Again, let me see. There we go. All right. Have a look at the bronchioli. All right. The bronchus and the bronchioli. Remember last week when we looked at the trachea goes down, then it splits into the bronchi, right and left bronchus, and those tubes get smaller and smaller called the bronchioli. And one of the things that we always needed to do, remember, was a proper ventilation system. Oxygen needed to come in freely and carbon dioxide needed to go out. I want you to have a look at these over here, these tubes. Okay? Let's see. Have a look there. That is open. All right? That is open. And in doing that, the food, all right, that, sorry, the food, the air is free to come and go as you like. Now, have a look over here. What happens is these muscles almost spasm. All right? So all of a sudden, you have this reaction where the airways start to close. And when the airways start to close, that's one of your efficient all right, gaseous exchange surface um, ideas out the window. Because all of a sudden, what can't happen? You can't get in any kind of oxygen. So you're wheezing. All right? So you're wheezing. So all of a sudden, it's a spasm and the, and the bronchioles, are they closed. So we're not getting that oxygen that we need. Now, there are a few triggers to that, right? Some people, when they're born with it, can, it's quite serious. Some have childhood asthma where they eventually, all right, do grow out of it. But if you have a look over here, what can sometimes happen is, is if you, you, you get sick, 
all right? Um, especially sometimes you'll see the older you get, or I'm one of those, right? At night, all of a sudden, you seem to get quite blocked, phlegmy, right? And then breathing starts to get more difficult. So sometimes if you're sick, all that phlegm, and that can also cause the restriction, can bring, bring on a spasm. Some people are allergic. You'll see I put a whole thing over here. An allergic reaction could bring on an asthma attack, certain foods, feathers, those are people who are allergic to like goose down feathers, certain molds, people are prone to it. Not everybody, but as I said, it's an allergic reaction. Your body has a weakness and it then has a way of right, showing that weakness in div different ways. Pollen, cigarettes, smoke, all right, and then obviously animals, dust, all these kind of things can bring on the reaction of asthma. Exercise is also one of them. Some of them, um, right, by exercise-induced asthma, um, doing too much, and then the bronchioles just spasm. So what happens, those of you who suffer from it, I think it must be terrible. It feels like somebody's squeezing your chest. I know if I sometimes feel like I just that I just need oxygen, I need to take deep breaths, all right? And you feel that there's this tightness in your chest and then you, you're battling to breathe. You have to, it's almost as if you have to breathe deeper to try and get more oxygen in, okay? And you <laughs> I think my husband can have a good chuckle, you wheeze. <laughs> if you like, at night, if you're sleeping and then you're breathing and you're like, uh, you know, that's pretty much how you sound like because the air is battling to get into, all right, your body. What they usually do, here we go, all right? I always call it a pompey. Everybody always laughs at me, all right? I coach a hockey team, and I think about half of them have amp pumps, all right? That is what we call a bronchodilator, okay? It's what it actually is. There's a bit of cortisone, all right? When they pump it in, it's a cortisone that causes the artery, the the muscles to also relax, and a muscle relaxant. So if all of a sudden you breathe that in, it opens the airways and it causes the muscles to relax so that they don't spasm, so that the airways then open and you can breathe easier. Are we time for a break? Because I can see there's like zero, zero, zero. Zero, zero, yeah, zero. James you hasn't sure? spoken to me yet. Okay. I well, need water. James is, no. Okay, it's cool. <laughs> anyway, well, we're going to go to ad break, but don't forget, Mindset is this whole lesson is proudly sponsored by Macmillan. Please don't forget, Mom, I love you to bits and pieces. And after this, we'll be right back. Welcome back, grade 11s. So we've been speaking about gases exchange and how your different things can affect certain things. Okay, that actually makes no sense if you're listening to what I'm saying. But if you're watching the show, then it makes perfect sense, right? Because I can't go through every little thing because that's what Cheryl's here to do. So I'm going to let her carry on with the lesson. And if you don't know where to find me, it's facebook.com forward slash learn extra so I can answer all your problems and all your questions, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Megan. Yeah, and now she's in trouble with her mom as well. <laughs> she wants to beat <laughs> yeah, me. Your mother <laughs> says, Megan. Okay, <laughs> the next one. I think nearly all of us, all right, suffer from this one, especially in the spring, spr spring time. Spring, spring time. time. Yes. <laughs> especially in the spring time, all right, when all the flowers are blooming and everything is cool, and what do we see? Lots and lots of pollen, okay? Now, when we look at a hay fever, I love this word, rhinitis, because if you are... <laughs> James says I have to use my pen more, <laughs> so I'm going to use my pen more. James, if you got rhinitis, it's uh, to me the it's just a really, all right, a nice big <laughs> word for a blocked nose, all right. So, uh, but I like the word though because if your nose is blocked, you you do tend to snort like a rhino, so it's a very appropriate word there. So what happens is is that dust and pollen. If you have a look to this picture over here. Right, they enter the nasal cavity, and for certain people, the dust and the pollen are what we call an irritant. So what they do is they cause a reaction in the nasal cavities, right, and in our nose, and our nose is very closely associated to our eyes, to our throat, and the body has a way in which it needs to get rid of it, and unfortunately not always very pleasant. One of the things to try and get rid of, all right, the pollen is to obviously sneeze, okay? 
In sneezing, you again getting all that mucus out. If there's any pollen that's trapped in the dust um, in your nose hairs that we spoke about last week, good sneeze is a not it's a quite a quite a hard action, and then the pollen grains are then taken out just so that you can try and feel better. But unfortunately, it causes the mucus membranes to become quite irritated, and you'll see if we have a look at some of our our symptoms here itching and swelling i know for, um, for me i also say uh, yes yeah um, the older you get the more you get all these things problems your <laughs> your eyes start to water all right um it, it feels it just tends to stream your nose tends to stream sometimes you get all itches and you just feel like you want to scratch all the time maybe your your neck gets a bit uh, red or you get all these little itchies okay so you'll see your throat there's like a little bit of a tingle we say frog in the throat right all of these things trying to be able to literally almost make you sneeze to get the mucus going that everything can then be rushed out of the body okay so treatment for this is most people take an antihistamine all right if you'll see over here i think allergex is one of the most common ones that you generally s tend to have so you take an antihistamine and which stops the allergic reaction right one of these and i think it sometimes makes the most sense but not always possible is the avoidance of the cause if you're allergic to something all right try and stay away because if you don't then you're going to get it and then we go to the next one that unfortunately becomes a bit prevalent now in the winter and that is bronchitis right just the word bronchitis all right in the beginning the bronchus if we go back here that should tell us exactly where it's going to be all right it's going to attack the bronchial tubes the bronchus and the bronchioles now unlike Oh, no, bro bronchioles. Unlike um, asthma, all right, it's actually the the fluid, the phlegm, all right, that's going to cause almost to get stuck in into the tubes. And again, our ventilation system isn't working as it should. So uh, what we're doing is all that that mucus. And what usually happens is we tend to get a viral infection, the flu, and the flu makes us a lot more susceptible to bacterial infections, which is usually happening over here. And then what happens is the bacteria comes in and that's going to occur with the, with the production of large amounts of mucus. And those large amounts of mucus are going to block the tubes. Remember what we said in the beginning, ventilation. I want oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. All of a sudden, if I make my tubes smaller, I'm going to battle to breathe. There we go. Have a look. If we have a look at this diagram over here. Okay, there we go. We talk about an irritated airway. Yes, my airway should be nice and open. But what do I have? All of these goblet cells are producing more and more mucus, and the mucus is lining over here, and we have to get rid of it. Now, how does our body get rid of, all right, all the mucus that is lining our lungs? Sounds simple to us, but believe it or not, a cough. A cough is actually quite a violent motion in your body all right because it takes it's taking your muscles all right your intercostal muscles and even your abdominals and it's squeezing right the diaphragm so it's taking your air passages and giving them a really hard squeeze because in squeezing hoping to bring that phlegm out okay because that's what you want to get out you want to get all the mucus away it's not so much about the muscles in asthma that were contracting here it's just all that gunky stuff that is all right lying in your lungs that we want to cough out and for those of you after a while it gets really sore to cough and it becomes irritating and for some people the bronchitis if it's left long enough then goes into the lungs and it becomes pneumonia which can be very serious so, and now I say to my kids, but they always say, oh, gross. When we talk about the mucus, you know, lots of you say snot, all right? When we talk about it, it's the color, which is, I know, gross, all right? But the color actually can tell us something about the, if it's infected or not. Generally, if it's a, a running stream and it's clear, that's just generally the mucus that is coming out of your nose. It's fine. But... If the, when you start coughing up phlegm and the nose and everything is yellow or green, all right, that's usually a sign of a bacterial infection. So if you're coughing up, all right, and it's all like a greenish yellowy color, that does, that's a sign that there is, there is probably bacterial infection. And if it's a bacterial infection, 
All right, what do we usually do? Here's good old antibiotics. Okay, antibiotics are able to break down to kill the bacteria. Not the virus, but the bacteria. And if we're not too sick, what we can sometimes do, we use over-the-counter medicine, we, we, you can use just cough syrup or something that tries to loosen that mucus so that we can cough it all up. But sometimes the problem is when we cough it all up, but then we swallow it again, and that actually can cause our tummies to not work so well. So sometimes it's just better to try and spit it out. But that's a bit gross if you're in public, so please don't. All right, and again, cover your mouth. Our next disease, all right, is emphysema. Um, I th this is a horrible disease, okay? And it's basic, it is caused by people, and you'll see the cigarette is there, all right, by people who smoke, right? Cigarette smoking. In the cigarette, there's tar, and that tar will actually adhere to the lungs, okay? And what it does is, that in emphysema, we actually start to break down the alveoli themselves actually break down. They disintegrate. And the alveoli is where gaseous exchange occurs. So what you're going to happen, you, you cannot breathe. All right, so I've got a gross picture over there. That's black, tar, tar covering lungs. the lungs. Tar lungs, <laughs> just a note. <laughs> Mom, Megan's Just monk. saying. <laughs> All right, and it's, um, it is a it, it's, it's, it's revolting. It's, it's terrible to look at. And if you, unfortunately, uh, my grandfather, all right, mm. had emphysema as he was it's a horrible. smoker. Oh no, and um, no. I think it's, I think to watch somebody, you know, that they are going to die, I think, you know, from that is, it's quite heartbreaking. So the, em the emphysema, as I said to you over here, all right, what happens is, have a look at the picture there. There's a nice healthy alveoli all nicely, lots of air, all right, in them, they're nice, they're round, like fresh, fresh grapes. Here, okay, with emphysema, what happens is the alveoli collapse. And the alveoli, as I said to you, is where gaseous exchange occurs. So if it collapses, what's happening? You're not going to be able to get that oxygen in. And you wheeze, all right? Because you can't get oxygen. Your body is, <laughs> the, the, the lungs are not working. That tar is covering it, the alveoli are disintegrating, and you battle with it. So when it comes to emphysema, and there is no cure for it, all right? You often will see some people who do have emphysema, all right? Found this picture that they, they've got, they carry like <laughs> oxygen. <laughs> that is so horrible. But they do <gasps> because they need the oxygen tanks to breathe, all wow. right? They need the, because need they that. cannot, their body cannot get in the, yeah, the, the oxygen. The oxygen they need, so yeah. So they actually need the oxygen tanks to, to breathe. And uh, that it's definitely terrible. does have a, a hor and it's not a quality of life that you really are looking for. Okay, as I said, these new they can try and give you those inhalers and all of those things to try and make the breathing easier. But unlike your other ones, that there there is no cure for it. Okay, right, not too pleasant. Okay, the last one I'm afraid as well. All right, when it comes to lung cancer, last year when you were in grade ten, all right. We said that ca um, my cancer is when mitosis right, happens uncontrollably. Because when a cell divides, it should have a trigger that says, okay, stop. Right? And now if that trigger doesn't work and the cell just carries on dividing, what can happen is it can form a malignant tu tumor. All right? So if we have a look here when it comes to lung cancer, that is the cells that are dividing. Right? I think we also need to be able to, to um, state that it's not necessarily smokers who are going to get lung cancer, right? I've heard they of people dying prone, from okay? secondary smoking. And that's unfortunately the thing, is our passive smokers, yeah. right? Is that people that are, I think that's why some of the laws are trying to be much more stricter, mm. is that the people that don't smoke, right, they also inhale the cigarette smoke and they then... Also, they all have all the tar, they have all the carcinogens that are inside that, which can also trigger lung cancer. And some people say, oh, I've been smoking for 70 years and I don't have lung cancer. Yes, we know, all right? But unfortunately, if you do decide to smoke or you're around somebody who smokes all the time, it does increase your chances. Now, we, uh, if you said to me, I use the word carcinogen, all right? Carcinogens. The carcinogens is... So is can you know that there's cancer producing products the carbon monoxide of cigarettes that's one of them the arsenic all right um, asbestos most of my kids when I talked about asbestos didn't have a clue what it is because they they don't build with it anymore 
but it's a fine, fine, fine substance that can travel all the way down and sit in your lungs and it, and it causes, it triggers, all right, the cancer cells and then you can, the people who come into contact with asbestos over a long period of time, right, did find that there was a large amount of lung cancer. If we have a look here, all right, we're talking about a tumor. A tumor is a cancerous mass. So a mass of cells that are malignant. When it comes to the lungs, all right, obviously those tumors are going to inhibit the ability of the lung to bring oxygen in and out. Again, our ventilation system. When it comes to treatment, it's the same as when you looked at in grade 10. There's a variety of treatments when it comes to cancer. All right, if we have a look over there. We could have um, surgery where they could try and cut the malignant tumor out. Sometimes, yes, in the lungs, they can try and cut it out. You do have two lungs. You might just, your um, capacity might lower down, but it is um, a possibility. And then there's the chemotherapy and the radiation treatments. For chemotherapy, the chemicals, and the radiation therapy, all right, literally x-rays, the rate radioisotopes that are going to then try and break down the cancer. Okay, it's curable to a certain extent, but not always. Okay, all right. So if we have a look here, what effect does smoking have on the gaseous exchange system? Now, if we have a look at uh, all our symptoms over here, We've covered them a bit, and I think Aslam is going to also cover it a bit when he does the heart disease. Because the lungs and the heart are so close together, right, they can have it, they do have an effect on each other, all right? If you'll see over here, if your lungs, all right, are battling to, um, to get oxygen in, what's going to happen to your heart? Your heart has to start beating f harder, right, to try and get the same amount of oxygen to the rest of the body. And if your heart has to pump harder, it's doing more work, it increases your blood pressure, or it makes sure that wha what happens in the heart is that it can cause a heart attack, a, a myocardial infarction, right, or in the brain it can cause a stroke where the blood vessels burst because of that high pressure. So not overworking the heart, all right, because the lungs aren't able to do their part, also is going to have a very serious effect, okay? The tar in the cigarettes, remember we spoke about last time, when we breathe in, there's the cilia, okay, can you remember when we looked at the trachea, all right, we had columnar epithelial cells, then we had our goblet cell, but we had cilia, and those cilia, all right, they know, still over there. Oh, me and my, let me get eraser. Okay, the cilia movement, called, they're like little waves. Imagine like the Mexican wave up and down your, your trachea, your tubes the whole time. Those waves, all right, are able to get the mucus in, the mucus out, the air in, the eye out. So it makes sure that the, the ventilation system is clean. When you smoke, the tar paralyzes the cilia. Right? And when it paralyzes the cilia, we're not getting all that yucky stuff out properly and it makes us more prone to infections. You do tend to find that some people who smoke, they do, in the winter especially, they tend to cough a lot. They are more prone to bronchitis. And James has just whispered in my ear. Mm. It's time for an Is outbreak. Okay. Yeah. Well, grade 11s. If you have any questions for me, I'm going to talk to Cheryl about all the questions that are on the page right now. And right after ad break, hopefully we will have answered all of them. So, see you afterwards. Welcome back, grade 11s. I hope you had a fantastic ad break. You jumped up and down and you're ready to tackle the next phase of gaseous exchange problems. And if you're not, that's okay, but you should really be paying attention to what's happening here because it's something that we deal with every day. There's always people maybe around smoking around you and you can actually tell them what's happening, what it causes, what they're doing to themselves. And something that I don't understand is why you'd want to make your life shorter. But that's just my personal opinion. Why inhale something that in the end causes more harm than good. But that's just Maggie's opinion. So 
that's I'm just giving it out there. But anyway, that's no scientific proof. I'm just going to go back to Cheryl, and she's going to give it all away with gaseous exchange problems. Okay, some of the comments were that I was going too fast. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. If I must go slower There's or a not. lot of information. There's a lot of information. Yeah. It's almost like information overload. But me and Megan are, well, Megan and me and Megan, how's okay, that yeah. English teacher? Eminem. <laughs> Uh, Megan and I are a little bit concerned about some of the <laughs> questions <laughs> on, our, on our Facebook. Yeah. Lots of you seem to be asking things about <laughs> the weed. <laughs> right, so we're not going to be answering that yeah, for sorry. you. Sorry. <laughs> All that we're going to say is don't do drugs. Yeah, uh, <laughs> don't do that, please. Kay, let's carry on. We were looking at how smoking affects the lungs. All right, and not only, we need to go back, shall I say, to the get the um, requirements of an efficient gaseous exchange system. So when we look at smoking, all right, the tar, the tar of the lungs, the tar from the cigarettes covers the lungs, all right, the tar, um, the cilia, all of a sudden, it's paralyzed, okay, they can't do their jobs. So what happens is, when breathing in and breathing out, things get stuck in there, because we need the cilia to move it out, if it doesn't move out, all the, the phlegm can stay in there, bacteria like to eat it, and then when they're eating it, that's when you're going to get your infections. And again, when we get to the lungs, remember gaseous exchange. What do we want to do? Oxygen must go out quickly. It can't go out if this thick, big, black, sticky tar all right, is going to then be covering the lungs. Okay, so that's, what, that's why the cigarettes are going to be so bad for you. And as I said to you, as soon as the lungs are not being able to get that oxygen, all right, out as quickly as possible, it's then going to put a strain on the heart because the heart now needs to almost take over and where the lungs are short falling, the l your body, your, your demand for oxygen doesn't change, all right? So, well, it does, obviously, if you exercise, etc., but it needs to stay the same, all right? You need, your cells need to get the oxygen. Now, all of a sudden, this nice big surface area isn't working properly, right? It's not thin anymore. It might not be moist. Sometimes cigarettes can dry up the pleural membrane, okay? You get like a form of pleurisy where it's quite dry, okay? You've, there's phlegm and mucus in your tubes. The oxygen, less oxygen is coming in, okay? So now what the heart needs to do is it needs to pump harder. And when it needs to pump harder, that puts a strain right on your cardiovascular system. Okay, increase in heart rate leads to an can lead to an increase in blood pressure. Blood pressure can lead to all right heart attacks, coronary disease. All right, it could lead to a stroke, which is pretty much a heart attack in the brain. Okay, and those, those are serious. They are very serious. It's a, it's a lifestyle change that we are talking about. Right, and obviously, what also needs to, the brain needs to get oxygen. If the brain's not getting oxygen, you can feel dizzy, they can faint, all right? And that also, if you could hurt yourself, if you're falling, etc. So it does, have a, it does have an effect on your quality of life, all right? The smoking. Now, if we have a look at... I just put in a brief little, right, a brief little part over here, all right. Uh, in about 2009, all right, our smoking legislation became quite, quite strict. And obviously, me, I'm not an, a non-smoker. Uh, I don't smoke. I'm a non-smoker. So I say yay. My sister, she goes boo. <laughs> right. So you also have people in the family who are, yeah. My mom also was very cross with my sister. If you have a look, basically what it does is it, it you're not allowed to, it, it starts to, you're not allowed to smoke in certain places, specifically public places, all right? Those of you, um, mostly my age, restaurants now, we, restaurants were, used to be, you could sit where you wanted to, all right? Um, now there's not. You have a specific designated area. It has to be um, cordoned off. It has to be separate from the rest. Um, they've recently bought in the last couple of years. Children aren't allowed to go into the smoking area either because, you know, they used to have smoking areas, but the children still went in. So no children in the smoking areas. If you have a look here, sports facilities, health facilities in office blocks, all right, you actually have to have a designated place where people can, all right, go and smoke. 
So not only did it where you can smoke, the laws became a bit stricter. But again, as I said, some of you, you don't, who are still quite young, um, when I went to Google, right, Google is my friend, when I went to Google to look for cigarette ads, you'd be amazed at how old they were. When, when I was small, right, when I was young, when we went to Biscopes and movies, um, tobacco products were freely advertised, all right? Um, it actually, there was the camel cigarettes, was a very tough, like, looking guy that, you know, made you, if you smoked, you're going to become hunky and all this. And, th and those, you, you went to, there's a lot of smoking, um, the smoking adverts. You don't see that anymore, all right? It is prohibited to advertise smoking, pro um, to any kind of tobacco products, on the TV, on billboards, etc. Um, they're not allowed to sponsor sports events anymore. There's a bit of a debate about that, whether it's good or bad. And believe it or not, you're actually not allowed to make any kind of toy cigarettes, any kind of sweeties, all right, that look like cigarettes. Often you used to get these little sweets oh, that look like cigarettes. You remember them? It's just put in your mouth and you used I to was pretend. So little you know, oh, you, you <laughs> Oh, so they're still around. Yeah, right. they were. Actually supposed to be banned. Then. <laughs> oh, well. That, oh, well, you know, such is life. As <laughs> long as they taste good. <laughs> All right, so those are part of the banning of the cigarettes. Um, also, you shouldn't smoke if you have children um, in the car. Again, secondhand smoke does have a definite effect on people who are not smokers. Okay, beaches, you'll see here. Beaches, public bathing, walkways. Um, service areas, health facilities, outdoor eating and drinking, right? Schools, right? Childcare facilities, right? I'm, I must admit, I'm a bit of a pet peeve for me. Is I'm a hockey coach, and then there's parents who, next to the sideline, right, sit and they smoke. <laughs> Unfortunately, the children, you know what? They're there. You need to be able to protect the children of. Our country. I'm sick. I'm saying very anti-smoking. I think I'm gonna. Uh, if I get I remember out of in here. old movies, they used to be able to smoke even in planes and stuff like that. They used to be able. Anyway, there was there was there yeah. wasn't any legislation. Mm. Yeah. Now it's completely different. Okay. Yeah. Now going on to the heart and the lungs. Yeah. But what we're actually trying to do is we're trying to to kickstart the heart here because it stops beating and it's and the lungs aren't then able to pump the oxygen throughout. Those of you. All right, and everybody should know how to do it, right, is CPR, artificial respiration, okay? If somebody should stop breathing, there is a procedure that you need to follow, and they always people always remember CAB, all right? Compressions, airway, breathing. Now, those of you who've done a first aid course will know what it is, all right, is where you literally have to breathe for that person. You've got to open their mouth, you've got to clear all their airways, Right, and then you breathe into it. You are the lungs. You have to compress. All right, I'm sure you all you need to find where it is. You compress. All right, a certain amount of time, and then you breathe a breath. Okay, trying to get the lungs to inflate, trying to get the heart started so that that oxygen can get back into the lungs. Okay, CPR. Everybody should know how to be able to do it. Okay, now the next one. Altitude is the height above sea level, okay? Altitude is the height above sea level. Us here in Joburg, we are much higher up than the people from Durban, Cape Town, etc. They are at sea level. Now, as you go higher up, so as you climb, if you're from sea level, and you start to go upwards, okay, Start to go upwards. Those of you who listen to the radio, Jacaranda or A Rod, this, this week he climbed Kilimanjaro. All right. As he goes upwards, what would ha what happened there? Altitude. Those of you who listened. All right. The oxygen he battled to breathe in oxygen. Now, what we tend to think is the higher we go. All right. The higher we go, the less oxygen there is. Not necessarily. Okay. The amount of oxygen stays the same. But the higher we go, the less air there is. All right? So the less air there is, we, when we breathe in a breath, all right, up here, when we take in that breath of air, 
All right, we breathe in less oxygen. That oxygen is available, but there's less air available. Okay, so what happens when we're down at the coast? We breathe in, all right, lots of oxygen. When we go up higher, we same breath, but there's small amounts of it. Okay, smaller than there was down at altitude. Now, those of you who've gone climbing, all right, will know that as the, the higher you get and that oxygen is less, your body needs to be able to make things right. Okay? You're not going to suffer from altitude. All of us living here in Joburg, right, do not suffer from altitude sickness. Even though we are higher than those Durbanites, what has our body been able to do? All right. Now there's a scenario. This, when we talk about the altitude, okay, it, um, athletes training use this principle quite a lot to enhance their fitness. Okay, so here, here is what happens. I want you to get to this. All right, let me go to the next one. Okay. Okay, we have a team from Durban. I don't know the Durban soccer club, so I'm not, I'm a bit, I'm a bit <laughs> bored when it comes don't to, ask to me. soccer. But let's <laughs> stick to rugby, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm a Zulu. Thank you, James. All right, just stand by, James, because I'm going to ask you another question just now. Okay. So I'm a Zulu, come up to Pretoria to play a game. Now, all of a sudden, as I said, the air is thinner, right? There's not as much oxygen available as there is down at the coast. So we start, they start running. They're going to get tired much more quickly, all right? They might feel a little bit nauseous. They might feel a little bit dizzy, all right? Because their body is used to this oxygen, and now all of a sudden, we can't get anything in, Okay. So in the beginning, things are not feeling so lacquer, but right, what your body does if you're going to train over a period of time is your body starts to acclimatize, right? And how it does this is awesome. What happens, have a look here, I'm going to show you. This lack of oxygen, right, and it's quite weird, is that the kidneys pick it up, right? It's not even the heart or the brain that the lack of oxygen, all right, in your blood is actually picked up by the kidneys. And what happens is a hormone is secreted, erythroprotein. Now, erythro, remember a red blood cell is an erythrocyte, a red blood cell. Erythro means red, all right, color. So what it starts to do, have a look here, all right, we don't, we're quite simple, what our body starts to do is we can't get more oxygen in, so that's fine. So you know what we do? We supply more taxis, right? We supply more taxis. So that hormone goes and it triggers the bone marrow, right? Remember last year when you did the skeleton in long bones? What do you find right here in the middle? Right, stem cells, bone marrow tissue. And bone marrow makes red and white blood cells, okay? So what do we have over here? Red blood cells. So this hormone goes, triggers it, and says, listen here, bone, we need more taxis. And the bone produces more and more red blood cells. So you increase the number of your red blood cells. With the increase in the number of your red blood cells, what then happens? More red blood cells, more oxygen can come into the body. Okay, so very often what athletes do is they go and train at higher altitudes for a long period of time. Their body starts to acclimatize. What does it start to do? It's not going to happen overnight, all right? It's going to take a while, all right? And what the body does, it produces more and more red blood cells. So the more red blood cells, the more oxygen we can take in. So, in other words, the athletes become fitter. Now, if they were to go down to sea level again, they would have this extra amount of red blood cells, so extra amount of oxygen. So, in actual fact, it's a body's natural way, all right, of, I won't say steroids, can't really say steroids, hey, what can we say? Um, it's a legal way of getting ahead. Yeah. Can we say that? Mm. I'm trying I to think, think so. of blood doping and all these mm. kind of things, but the <laughs> words for the moment just... Okay, so us people here 
in Joburg, we've got more red blood cells than you guys in Durban. Just right? saying. Hey? I said just saying. Just saying. Yeah, just saying. Right, so that's why when we get down to Durban, we act a little bit crazy because we've no. got so much oxygen. And taking all on right. the sun. Hey? <laughs> so as I said, for sports teams, all right, that's a really they, they can change their training, right, depending on if they're going down, up it, and up. I think James says we need to need wrap. Need to wrap. We're so wrap, wrap, thank wrap. you, Grady Levins, for this fantastic show. Thank you, Macmillan, for the show. And I hope you learned quite a lot because I know I did. So have a great afternoon, Mindsetters, and I'll see you next week. Bye.